actually give us the best case study, hi, the best case study right here in Detroit of mapping change. So who here is from Detroit? Awesome. Do you know where this is? We'll find out. So um, I'm not from Detroit, but it's been impossible to miss the stories in the news media about Detroit's revival. And um, for me, um, there are lots of pictures that are very beautiful in these, uh, in these news articles about Detroit. This one is my personal favorite. I'm from New York, and it amazes me how the Times managed to come up with a story of Detroit that's all about New York. It basically says, you know, it's the sixth borough, which um, I always find amusing. So um, for me, the story of Detroit is frequently told in pictures and numbers. And um, this number is the total number of properties demolished um, since the bankruptcy in 2013, um, which um, Tyler is going to tell us a little bit more about. And um, this is the number across all the city council districts. And uh, for us, what usually follows this is remarks about how property values have increased as a result. And um, this is uh, findings of a report that was published about one year into the program. Uh, and again, for me, the missing piece of these pictures and numbers is a sense of what's really happening on the ground. In, um, in, uh, in, in these numbers, I ask myself, you know, does it actually reflect the nuances across each neighborhood? Do the very glossy pictures in the New York Times really tell you the whole picture of what's actually happening in Detroit? So Data Driven Detroit, um, an organization here, did this fantastic study called uh, Turning the Corner, where they took a lot of these public data sets that Dexter was describing, things like demolitions and property values, but also things like uh, crime rates and uh, commercial permits. And they layered on top of that hyper-local information, knowledge and experience um, through surveys with feedback like this around how people felt about living in Detroit. And what they came up with was um, a neighborhood change index, which is this extremely intricate block-by-block -block study of um, neighborhood's propensity to change. So when we, this was released sometime in 2017. Uh, in 2018, when the city just released the most recent property value assessments, it was really quite uncanny to see how it mapped really well to the predictions. Uh, for me, uh, what this means is um, validation for hyper-local knowledge and experience, and OpenStreetMap is really uniquely positioned to give that kind of input for mapping change. So when we pull down static snapshots from OpenStreetMap, and in this case, this is a map of um, amenities, which is relevant, it's not terribly useful for the purpose of mapping change. So what I'd like to do right now is to highlight very quickly three tools that do a great job of talking about change in OSM over time. So OSM Analytics is a tool developed by HOT and its partners, and it does a very good job visualizing uh, additions in buildings, roads, and amenities from year to year. And in this shot, I'm showing you what it looks like from 2014 to 2018. You can see an increase of density in amenities like hotels in downtown Detroit. Is OSM up to date? This is uh, the result of some academic work uh, com coming out of Italy. And what this does is it helps you filter and segment nodes in OSM based on things like recency and frequency of updates. In Detroit, what we've seen is a lot of updates related to things like transit nodes, like bus stops and light rail trams. And um, the last tool I want to talk about is Urchin, which is fresh off the press. Derek Liu is over here. Derek, wave. Derek Liu is over here from Development Seed. He is going to talk about this tool that he's developed tomorrow at 4.30. You guys should definitely check it out. And what this does is it uses satellite-driven, uh, satellite-derived detection technology combined with some of these other data sets to give you a good picture of what change is happening and how to actually um, guide OSM edits. In looking over these tools, the common challenge that I found uh, underscored a very obvious OpenStreetMap challenge, which is uh, you know, the data that is shown over time is really only as good as the data that goes in. Even with satellite uh, imagery, there are blind spots. For example, uh, with, with Urchin, it's very easy to see a difference where you're looking at building versus no building, as in the case of a demolition. But um, for in a case of new building versus old building, in a case of uh, renovations or repurposing, this stuff is a little bit more difficult to see. So for this reason, I am extremely excited about uh, the effort that Dexter was describing about capturing street level imagery across all of Detroit. We're going to recap this a little bit. This again, you've already seen some of this, is how it looks. It's high accuracy, high quality, 360 imagery captured with a professional camera, not a GoPro. Um, and all this is being uploaded into Mapillary, like that Dexter said. And because it's going to be available in Mapillary, it's going to be available in OpenStreetMap for you to edit with an ID in JOSM. 
And um, while I believe the city has every intention to maintain this and keep this fresh, the nice thing about Mapillary is that anyone can use GoPros or cell phones or any sort of device to capture and contribute imagery to Mapillary to keep the imagery updated and fresh for us to keep it going between the city's collection efforts. Um, so uh, once the imagery is in Mapillary, not only do we host it and display it to you, we run our state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms to tell you what's in the images. In this case, you can see traffic lights and buildings and um, other types of objects within the photo. And um, not only do we understand what this says, because of something I'm going to let Jubal talk about, uh, we now have a rounded out view of how it actually changed over time. So. Thanks, Janine. Hi, I'm Jubal Harpster from Microsoft. I drive the OSM initiative uh, within Big Maps. Um, so I'm going to talk about our recent street side contributions to OSM. Um, so we captured 80% uh, of the US population uh, between 2013 and 2016 um, was uh, street level imagery for you know, high fidelity panoramas. Um, so we've got uh, 1.6 million kilometers of road in the US. Um, and if you look at the map here, all the blue areas in Detroit, it's almost completely covered for the Detroit metro area. So there's a ton of imagery in there. Um, it's just a little bit dated. Um, we, we recently did an ID integration, so you can actually load the street side imagery into ID, and you can use that for editing. Um, street side, uh, turn restrictions, uh, one ways, anything that you can see in the imagery is definitely available for mapping. Um, and it's, you know, we found that, like, because our imagery is a little bit dated, you can sort of overlay Bing and Bing street side and then use the mapillary um, imagery for a little bit more updated view and sort of validate that something, that a turn restriction is there is still there. Um, we do have a JOSM plugin, which is um, out there in the open right now. I'm working with Microsoft internally to actually open, open source the code. This was implemented by our, by our good friends at Critigen. Um, it's actually about six months of legal work so far, so it's actually quite a bit of effort for me. Um, once it's out there, though, it'll be available for editing against anything in OpenStreetMap. And again, it's another layer that you can use in conjunction with Mapillary to validate um, features that are actually on the ground. Um, so I hope everybody takes advantage of that and uses it as much as possible. Yep, thanks, Janine. Thank you, Jubal. <laughs> uh, so now that we have Microsoft imagery and Mapillary imagery on OpenStreetMap, we can now actually take a look at some of the findings using the tools that I, that I mentioned. So um, this over here is, um, is, is a part of Corktown. Um, some of you may be staying here this weekend. Uh, there is a very trendy new hotel where there used to be a flop house here in Trumbull and Porter. So that's one example of an amenity that is easy to uncover using some of these tools. Um, this is a new light rail uh, system that zips past a lot of commercial, uh, commercial properties that didn't exist before 2015. So, and uh, this one I like very much, and this is something that you can see through something like Urchin, because it's a clear case of empty lot where, you know, and, and now there is actually a new commercial uh, residential property development. So this is all very clear. Um, in some parts of Detroit, uh, things look actually very similar. So there was, I, I did a little exercise looking at the um, neighborhood change index, and you can see how some blocks pretty much look the same at the moment, which which brings up a lot of conversation about, you know, is the revival happening and e evenly in all these parts. But the interesting thing is you move, you move a few blocks over and you can see small changes that aren't very visible, but at the same time, things like, you know, that house renovated over there, the schools moved, and I think what this indicates is changes not totally obvious at the moment, but definitely on its way. So on that note, I'd like to get Tyler and, and, then, and then Matt to talk about what this actually looked like on the ground. Um, so I'm here to talk about one of the uh, sort of main ingesters and aggregators of a lot of this geospatial data, that's the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Um, so a little context. So the Detroit Land Bank Authority is, um, was established to basically consolidate, um, uh, foreclosed, abandoned, and forfeited properties throughout the city of Detroit. There were numerous agencies that um, had these properties in their custody. A couple of them are listed here. Um, and the Detroit Land Bank Authority was established to sort of streamline that process because all of these different agencies had their different processes, different procedures. Um, so uh, what that means, what that actually looks like on a numerical level is, uh, so that's about 95,000 parcels um, under Detroit Land Bank ownership. Um, 30,000 of those or so 
um, have structures on them. And that's out of a city um, with about 383,000 parcels total. So we're talking about a quarter or so of all property in the city of Detroit. <clears throat> um, so the question comes up, what happens with these properties? What does the land bank do with these properties? Um, and the objective is to uh, sort of push them um, to their highest and best use, depending on a number of conditions. And this is sort of uh, the more or less range of opportunity for properties. Um, uh, they're assessed across a number of sort of broad factors, and these um, include stability of neighborhood, Stability might not be the word, more so like neighborhood context, I suppose. Um, condition of the specific property itself and occupancy. Those are sort of like the main three vectors. Um, and I'll go into sort of breaking down how we use those. Um, if you think about occupancy, um, it's difficult, if not possible, to truly say um, whether or not a property is occupied or how long it's going to be occupied. Um, and, you know, through data sharing we've, um, with different utility companies and different, um, uh, different agencies, we can sort of infer with uh, utility data, self-reporting, and just general observational um, uh, reportings. Um, so here's the sense of uh, what the actual Detroit Bank land ownership uh, Detroit land bank ownership looks like across the city. Um, and if we're talking about neighborhood context, uh, you can see not, it's, not, um, it's not equally distributed. You have, uh, you'll, you'll see um, sort of like more concentrated ownership in certain neighborhoods throughout the city. And then if you think about um, other contexts to consider median property um, sale value, you'll see, um, you, you start to see a picture of how the land bank sort of considers these things. And then another context might be sort of um, total number of recorded property sales. Uh, and so, uh, so then moving on to sort of like the third vector being specific property condition, um, which really requires on the ground um, specific observation, street level observation. Um, we, uh, we can start looking at some of the different properties the land bank sort of owned over time. Um, and, you know, they vary from, you know, sort of these estately, well-maintained properties to sort of what, you know, people um, would imagine the owner of last resort in the city of Detroit um, might have in its inventory. And uh, similar sort of uh, context here. And then, so um, move over to Matt, who's sort of going to give um, an overview of how we sort of integrate um, uh, Mapillary and other tools to sort of support uh, the context behind uh, the space and uh, and conditional properties. Oh, shaky. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Dobson. I was an intern over the summer for the Department of Innovation and Technology for the City of Detroit. I'm currently a public policy student at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, I come from a software development background, so we came up with this really interesting project on how to update some current tools the land bank has to give them um, a, a fuller spatial context of a property within a neighborhood. And for ground level policy decision makers, these kinds of uh, information is very important for trying to justify any kind of policy making that you're going to be doing for these neighborhoods to ensure that it's equitable and it's actually going to help the citizens that live in these places. So uh, in policy school, we like to start with the status quo, uh, which is what they have right now. And one option is always to not change it, but uh, we all kind of got together and decided that we wanted to change it. Uh, currently in their tool set, they only had a static image of a property that kind of varied in quality. Everything from, uh, it could have been taken in a rainstorm and made blurry, somebody could have touched part of the camera and obstructed part of the property. Um, all sorts of issues that kind of stemmed from that. And also a static uh, Google map of the location where with just a pin dropped, which doesn't necessarily give information about the shape of a property parcel, which is also very important in making decisions about what to do with different parts of the city itself. So our approach was to incorporate uh, Mapillary to use a 360 view to allow policymakers to actually have a full view of what a neighborhood looks like, things that could be next to buildings, 
across the street. All of these things are important when trying to factor into the decision making process of what to do with a property that is owned by the land bank. Next, the uh, I don't know if they're still here, but the Emerging uh, Technologies team created this really awesome parcel viewer that I uh, also remixed to actually combine with the Mapillary uh, 360 view that would actually give an outline of a parcel using a map box tile layer. So not only could you see ground level assets that are in a neighborhood, but you could also see the shape of a property itself. So it might be a very stately house, but it might be very short on the sides and long uh, in another dimension where they might have a big backyard but not very much time, uh, space on the sides of the properties. And then um, we wanted to make sure that it was incredibly usable because you can't build a tool and not have people want to use it. So I think Mapillary was a really awesome approach because it was very intuitive for people to kind of click into and start using almost immediately. Um, so some lessons learned from actually going over and building all of this is that context is key when trying to display spatially driven data. It's really important that people that make decisions have all the information that we can give them so they can make decisions that are equitable for different communities. Um, the context uh, of a neighborhood itself isn't just a straight on view of a building, it's the combination of multiple factors including things that are around the building and the shape of the land that the building is on itself. And um, we really needed to focus on making something that was easy to use but also could deliver important information for people making decisions. Uh, and this was the solution we came up with. We have a nice big Mapillary uh, 360 view where you can zoom in and it puts a pin right onto the property so you can focus the attention on taking an actual look at the property from that street level. And we're gonna integrate with Dexter's project of uh, using all of the imagery that is street level that they are capturing currently. And then uh, right next to it is the parcel viewer where it outlines the shape of the parcel and allows people to see like, oh, hey, this is the, the length of that uh, building is probably the length of the the parcel as well, and uh, I think that's I think that's it. Yeah. So I just want to wrap up. Um, so uh, by going back to where we started, actually. So this is actually, uh, I, I, as I understand it, a pretty iconic block some, on Michigan Avenue in Corktown. Um, and this was taken in. Does anyone want to take a gander? 2014 or 2018? Detroiters. 2014 or 2018? This is from the Microsoft Bing 2014 database, and uh, this is what it looks like now, Mapillary on 2018. Uh, so I hope you find both of these resources useful as we continue mapping together in Detroit and beyond, and um, I'll take any questions now. Cool. Well, I'll be around, and uh, my team wearing Mapillary t-shirts will be around as well. So let us know if you have any questions, and please do check out Derek's talk on Urchin tomorrow at 4:30. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>